Hi everyone, this is Joshua Hoffman and welcome to another episode of the Masters in Marketing Agency podcast, where we deconstruct the why and how agency owners found their success and discuss a few things they learned along the way. Today I have Shanta Adhikari, the founder and CEO of Ad Media NYC, a marketing firm that helps local dental practices develop profitable customer acquisition channels using direct response advertising and remote sales teams. Welcome Shanta. Thank you. Happy to be here. Of course, and then of course, right before the call, I was, you know, I'm going to say it here. I, I think you got a badass first name. So uh, that's how we'll, we'll open up. Um, <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. In addition to that, uh, another badass thing I saw, at least on your LinkedIn, is that you were an iOS game developer um, prior to, you know, the age, starting the agencies. So how did you get into that and what kind of games did you make? Yes, sir. So in high school, uh, I was kind of being pushed to do computer science. Uh, so, uh, so I thought I'd delve into it. I ended up really liking it. So I got into this program that helps you uh, build um, uh, applications and games on the uh, App Store for iPhone, uh, for Apple. So I got into the program and I ended up making this game where it was around, it was around the presidential election with Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump. And there was a lot of hate People hated Hillary. People hated Trump. It was a lot of that. So I created this game where it's uh, the concept from Whack-A-Mole, the arcade game, where it's basically Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, where you get to choose which one you hate more, and then you play a whack a press game, which is the name of the game, whack a press uh, and you basically play a game where you, uh, you know, you whack them. And yeah, there was, I, I also put in like this uh, cheat code that you could do, so you could get a higher score, way higher than everybody else. That was like hard to find, but that also made it a little bit more fun. So we'd have like competitions at my school, and yeah, that was nice. Wait, wait, what was the what was the cheat code like? Yeah, cheat code was basic. Yeah. So there was nine places where the like the heads would pop up, and the cheat code was basically uh, in uh, in one of the in one of the places. If you if the head did pop up from, if you were able to successfully touch it, you could hold on to it, and the head would keep popping, and you would just keep points, 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 points. It was like you, actually, you did. You actually developed it like that, like as a little yeah. uh, like Easter egg. Yes. Did, do you think anyone actually? You know? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, people did. People did. Yeah, yeah. That was that's what made it fun. So that's like people, people, people that have like the point totals that are like twenty times yours, and you thought you killed yeah, it. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Did that happen? Uh, that's funny. <laughs> Um, now moving on to the business side, um, and kind of jumping right into it, you know, you started your firm, I believe in December, 2020, obviously kind of, you know, kind of in the heart of the pandemic. Um, I guess we were starting to get out of the craziness side of the pandemic, but obviously a really unique time to start a business. So, um, you know, what made you start it, and, and were you confident in starting it and, and getting started? Yeah, great question. Um, it was right. Yeah, so I believe the pandemic happened around March that year. Um, I was still in school. And when that first semester ended, I was kind of in a place where what the hell do I do? Uh, do I don't want to go back to school. Computer science kind of sucks. Um, and over that summer, I was doing a lot of things. I was drop shipping. I was trying to learn about the agency. I was getting into like how to build a software, all these kind of things. Um, and I got a few clients as a freelancer that was for marketing. Around the end of December, I got a few clients ranging from a dentist, a HVAC guy, a roofer, a carpet cleaner, a pressure wash guy. The person I liked the most was the dentist. On top of that, the dental industry was the, the second most saturated, if not the most saturated industry in the market. And I thought if I was going to do something, why not choose the hardest? Um, make it more challenging. Sort of got. That was my thought. Why, uh, why, though, decide to stick with one niche instead of go to multiple categories? Industries. Um, this is something I learned from a lot of the gurus out there, which is um, being an expert in one thing is way better than being an expert in a hundred things. So pick in one industry. Did you, speaking of these gurus, did you do like the classes and, and those kind of things to get yourself prepped for marketing worlds or did you learn it yourself? Uh, I took one course uh, that was, I guess, very helpful for me, which was, can I say the name? 
Yeah. I'm sure, yeah. 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 Sweet publicity. He's awesome. Uh, yeah. Jeff Miller, uh, who I took his course and it really helped me get like the foundations down to get to like zero to 10 K type of thing. Um, and that his, his, I guess, the um, course and coaching services really helped me um, develop it. Uh, they'll develop the foundations. So then how did you get started? How did you get your first customer? Um, all that kind of stuff. So the course kind of outlined um, a lot of the ways you can get your... So my first ever agency client as a freelancer was cold email. So I blasted out. I hired a one of my friends. And so us two together, we would sit down for two hours a day for five days a week where we just send out a shit ton of, e- a shit ton of emails. Um, and that's why I landed my first client. I was uh, sitting in the gym and the guy called and he was like, Shanta, I really feel like I should not be doing this. You have no idea what you're doing, it sounds like, but let's get started. <laughs> and that's that, like a- that was that the was total- car wash. Car wash, okay, you said. Um, how many emails do you think you sent out and how many responses do you think you, or do you remember getting? I think I sent out around 600, 700. Um, and I probably got like, five responses one of them was him what what happened with the other responses Were they like no screw off responses or i've gotten a few of those these four yeah most of them were no's uh, i think it was two yeses and the other guy i don't think ever responded to our phone oh so how did you end up getting your second customer then because obviously you know I, a lot of people actually start with referrals or their friend asked them to do a project or something like that um and I actually commend you a lot for starting with cold emailing because that's one of the tougher ways of, of getting customers. And a, a lot of times people won't even do it now because they're just running with word of mouth and referrals. So um, I think that's pretty incredible. And I guess you're saying that you got that, let's call it idea from one of these like gurus or the videos that you watched? Yes, the course that I took, yes. So then how did you get your second customer? Did you say like, okay, you know, that worked for one customer. Let me keep doing cold email. Uh, the second customer it actually took a while. So this first one I uh, signed around in the summer or actually around like uh, September or August or something like that, August or September. Um, the next one took me like a month and a half where it was through an Instagram message. Uh, so at some point, I forget when I started doing then on top of cold email, I believe I hired a like a VA to do cold email, and then I myself would do Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn messages. And then this one I signed from Instagram, um, which was an HVAC person uh, running an HVAC company. Do you remember any of the like messaging they used in either the cold email yeah. or this? Yes, it was. I I forgot where I picked this up from, but it was very like uh, vague. So it'll be like <laughs> it'll be like. Hey, uh, do you offer HVAC services? Uh, obviously, they're gonna be like yes, because I'm a- and I'm trying to act like a customer. Awesome. Hey, uh, by any chance, do you do this type of service for HVAC? They're like yes. Hey, fantastic, fantastic. Can I? Uh, can I, uh, it was. Hey, awesome. Um, do you mind if I uh, pitch you real quick or something like that? Like, can I pitch you real quick? They say yes. Okay, fantastic. Hey, look, I can do this for you. Uh, do you have like? Would it be impossible for us to spend five minutes together over a call? Um, and I mean, at some point, it's a numbers game. You do it so many times that someone's going to say yes. Is And how do you guys get new customers now? Similar ways or is it more? Yeah. No, uh, just paid advertising. And so referral. you don't cold emailing or messaging anymore. It's, it's really through paid ads. Correct. Uh, at some point, it became clear that around... Um, Maybe when we had like 15, 16 clients that the cost to acquire a client via paid ads was way better than the labor and the money that goes into doing organic, for us at least. Interesting. Uh, those are more unique ways than a lot of the, the ways that we hear. So uh, I, I think that's awesome. Uh, now taking a step back, do you mind just telling us a little bit more about the agency? Uh, sure. So we work specifically, uh, so we're a bit unique in that uh, we work with dentists only and we only advertise one service that they have. That's it, which is dental implants. And that is it. We only work with dentists that do dental implants and we only advertise dental implants. Uh, we're primarily social media based where we advertise on Facebook and Instagram like a SMMA and uh, we generate the leads. We have an internal call center where we also call the leads, qualify them, book them in, get them to show, and we even follow up after the initial appointment with the dentist. 
Uh, so we're basically t- providing this turnkey uh, solution where we handle everything from getting the lead to getting the patient to show. A uh, couple other things that might be helpful, we make it so easy to sign up with us that we don't need access to their Facebook, their Google, their Instagram, their schedule, nothing. Literally all the client, they don't even have an onboarding form. Uh, literally the client signs up, signs an agreement, we hop on a launch call, and boom, we're good to go after three days. Uh, is there any, you know, is there any difference between marketing for maybe dentists than other, you know, agencies? Uh, is there anything that you kind of identified that you need to do specifically for dentists that maybe you don't do, they would not be, you know, involved in another category, another industry? In terms of marketing for the dentist or marketing to the dentist? Marketing for the dentist or both, if you want to take it or either. Uh, Marketing to the dentist. Dentists are a very unique category of people. Uh, they are the they have the highest debt among medical schools. It seems like you could graduate five hundred thousand dollars in debt. Like Jesus Christ, uh, they have the high suicide rate. They're typically very stressed uh, and lonely. Uh, they are. Uh, people don't generally like to go to the dentist, even though it's a very, very important thing for your health. So that makes it even worse for them. Uh, there's a lot of problems. Uh, and so approaching the dentist on top of the fact that they are getting pitched 24-7 has to be a little different where you cannot. I mean, this goes for any industry, but it really comes down for dentists where you cannot act like a salesperson or a marketer. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Marketing for the dentist is very difficult because we sell our service, which is dental implants, which is a very high ticket service. It can go from $3,000 to $60,000. And unfortunately, the people that need it the most are in the low and middle income demographic. So it's very expensive, but the people that need it are, don't have the money to fund it. So we have this big disparity where we have to find the small population that are in the low middle income demographic, but they somehow do have the money and they need a $60,000 service. Interesting. No, that's uh, yeah. I mean, I guess obviously you're in, you're looking for a niche within, within a niche, I guess. Um, very interesting. Uh, when do you think was kind of like the right stage to grow from, you know, call it a solo entrepreneur to, to hiring a team? Uh, I got asked this couple times, and I, I want to be clear. What do you mean by hiring a team? Is it like my first person or like a couple people? Let's go with first person. The second I had money coming in, I hired my first person. Uh, nice. The second I saw my um, – well, actually, I should have. But uh, after I saw my second client, I hired my first um, – no, I apologize. I apologize. When I, hired my, when, I, when I signed my first client, I hired my first VA. And that was a VA, but um, – yeah, that's yeah. the first one. What were they helping out with? Uh, prospecting. So oh. uh, the biggest thing I needed was more revenue coming in, more money coming in, um, and they were very. There was task that was very repetitive, which could have been outsourced. So I gave that away. Whereas everything else was very much more. So, um, so obviously, you know, you're you're using VAs and consultants. So uh, if you're open to it, what is like your split between full time employees and you know VAs or consultants? Currently, yeah. Uh, ratio, uh, right now we have only full time employees, no consultants. Actually, we have one consultant right now. Yeah, I, I apologize. Uh, we have only full time employees and one consultant. Are any of those full time employees VAs? Yes. Uh, most of them. Uh, no, not most of them. VA as in admin stuff, or VA as in someone overseas. However you want to define it. <laughs> so I'll just give the breakdown. Uh, so we have a total of, I believe, 22 team members. Uh, pr- most of them are overseas. So we have five American and rest overseas. Most are in South America um, and most are in South America. And yeah, they a lot of them are managers as well. So they're not like doing small things. They're very, very important roles in the company. Sure. Right, exactly. No, no, I... Based on how you answered that question, I kind of knew. So I was like, "All right, let's tell, see how you'll you'll answer it." Yeah. Have you had any uh, bad hires? Yes. Uh, 
one time I hired a guy to do my calls and I found out two weeks in, he was doing amazing. This is after onboarding. He was killing it. Dude was booking so many appointments. I'm like, Jesus Christ. I find out that in one day, I'm listening to the calls. He's doing the calls drunk. Wow. Uh, so that was insane where he was a high performer, but uh, he had uh, flaws and holes in the well or whatever the phrase is. That's interesting because, you know, I, I came from the sales world and I have my, the rule is for me, like build rapport uh, as your first step. And then you like ask questions, show value, like, the, you know, there's the steps that you go through. And it's funny because I do think that, you know, building rapport is the most important step because you're building trust and all that kind of stuff. And I mm-hmm. guess what it sounds like is because he was drunk, he was actually doing really good on the rapport building, which was probably getting those calls in. But like, come on now, like this can't. Am I am I sort of right with that? It might have, it might have, but uh, that day he uh, messed up. He really messed up. He got oh. too drunk. way too drunk. That's wild. That that's a first. That's a first that I've, I've heard on. What the hell, bro? <laughs> well, my next my next question was going to be like, do you, and and I don't know if it's related to that person because I don't know if you can find this in an interview if they're going to be a drunk if they're not drunk on the interview. But like, do you have any best practices for or tips for hiring? Or finding good VAs or finding, you know, anything like that? Uh, the one thing, I'm a bit more unconventional in this aspect, which is why now I have help for it. Um, uh, but I've never looked at the resume. <laughs> uh, I don't typically look at it. I've always placed personality over talent for me. Uh, one of our core values is kindness. That is something I look for. Um, and so when I'm going about hiring someone, I always look at on top of, you know, their skills and experience, how is their personality? Like, is this someone I can actually work with? I love what, uh, there's this book. I cannot forget. I can't remember the name. Uh, but the guy said something like, if you can't spend two hours with them stuck on a airport, then don't hire them. Um, you know what I'm talking about? I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm literally trying to Google it to, while you, while you say it to see um, if I can do it. I think it's. Uh, I think I have it right here. We'll take. Uh... Sorry, actually, I don't know if I could do this, but uh, it's. Uh, yeah, the the chairman, CEO, and co-founder of Blackstone. Okay. Uh, the last question I'm going to ask, by the way, is books and podcast recommendations. So hopefully, hopefully, while we we continue, like it'll come back and we can we can throw yeah. it in at the end. You got it. Uh, um, interesting. Very interesting. Uh, uh, any any other? You know, are, are there any like mistakes that you've made that you can kind of think about and talk through? Sure. Uh, so in the beginning, uh, I think this is this is a very, very important. So in the beginning, we did not look for experience. We looked for anybody that would be willing to join us and, you know, freaking work with us and do it fast. Every time we needed someone, it was like, we need someone tomorrow. Uh, in the beginning, we made a lot of hires, maybe up to like uh, 10 or 11 or 12 that we just hired based on necessity. Uh, didn't look that much on experience or talent or how long they'd be willing to stay and all that kind of important stuff. Um, at some point when you grow, you will experience that, you know, taking those actions will actually hurt you. You will get to a point where the company has scaled faster than your teammates. You will get to a point where the lack of experience that other team members have can actually hurt you. And so the, If that was to happen, um, there's no exact numbers for it. But if that was to happen, I think the most important thing that I've really neglected was making sure if you're going to keep the people on the team or you're going to replace them. But most if you keep them, you have to train them, whether that's from you or from an external source. You're constantly as an entrepreneur, you're always training yourself. You're reading the books, you're watching, reading, listening to the podcast, watching the YouTube videos, whatever you're doing. The same has to go for your team, uh, because if they're not being built, if not if they're not growing, then that's going to hurt you. Because if for an agency, the agency is your team. At the end well, of the day, I, I saw this like meme one time, and I, I re- referenced it before, but and I wish I could find it. But it was like a line that said, you know, it's like one C-suite talking to another C-suite, and they're like, "What if I train them and they leave?" And then the other person says, "What if you don't?" And I, that always stuck in my mind. Like, you know, you can't be afraid of like putting in resources to these people with this fear that they might leave because the opposite is, is even worse. 
Um, so a question on that, like how, how do you do that? How do you make sure that everyone's staying on top of their stuff and, and is trained properly and everything like that? Um, I personally, uh, uh, what I try to do is I go out and learn the things that they should learn because I always like to learn and I take that, create, um, a training on it. And then I train my team. That's something I've always, uh, tried to do. So whatever, but let's say I read a book like this, that's somehow related to the, the advertising team. I would read it, consume it, distill the information and then do a training with the media buying team. Uh, the other best way is let them find what they think they need. Don't look at the price for now. I mean, unless it's like $10,000, um, but don't try to find what they need and I'll get it for them and we'll all go through it together and we'll like hold like post meetings after it to um, have conclusions from it. Any uh, specific examples on that? Um, not that one, but I have a different one that might be even helpful. Sure. Uh, so we have a, a call center team. None of us, by the way, the entire company, no one has experience in dental prior to being part of the agency so my entire call center team we don't have experience in dental so what we would actually do is for our best clients we would hire them with the owner and their front desk people and their managers and they would train our call center very interesting oh no that's i like that that's huh we do it like once a month with a different client that you'll you'll basically like have these calls and be like and just to have ask them questions and everything like that and then you'll yeah. jump to another customer the, the next month and get yeah. different points. Some of them will even build out an, like a whole training thing for us because well our success is their success. That's that is very interesting. Um, jumping to a few questions, I, I tend to ask at the end. Um, if you had to teach something to other marketers, what would it be? Marketing marketers uh, specifically. Yeah. Um, if I had to teach something, the next question is more broad. So this one will, will pin in, in marketing. Uh, I think in marketing, because marketing changes so freaking often after you've been a marketer for so long in a specific field, let's say I've been a Facebook and Google, uh, uh, direct responses marketer on yeah Facebook and Google for a long time. When new things come about, you kind of get a little hesitant. You get a little uh, protective of the platforms you're on. You get a little, I don't know, um, scared to try something new. As a marketer, especially digital marketing, that changes every f fucking day. You have to be open to trying new things. So while you are investing your time in maybe learning or honing your craft in the things that you're already good at, I would always make a time and place to try other things. Um, and there's a better cost per lead, cost per appointment, cost per acquisition, whatever is important for you somewhere else. Uh, you just have to be willing to test and find it. I think we marketers love testing, but we don't, you know, we love saying testing. We got to test this and that, but we don't always hold it to our own behaviors. Um, that was, that's great. No, I, I love that. I think that goes outside of marketing too, um, which I know I told you to pin it into marketing, but uh, no, I think that, I think that totally goes where everything, er, I forget who Ryan holiday was talking to on his podcast, but the guy, you know, someone famous too, but in his book, um, he was saying that like, I get that. I was trying to think of, I, I get that. Like you're, you're doing these things because it's how you, it's what got you here, but like, maybe you should test a different, um, style or whatever, just to see what you, what comes out of it. And you'll never know unless you do try it. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of similar to what you're saying. It is, yeah. What do you enjoy talking about the most that you normally don't get an opportunity to talk about? Um, I enjoy talking about the most. I really enjoy talking about I really liked uh, talking about how we can influence other people ethically. Um, I really like that specific topic a lot. Uh, it's something I've been uh, studying on a lot recently and I only have like one or two people I can really talk to that about. And that's been, uh, something interesting. Entrepreneurship is also another one. It's very broad, but, uh, I love talking about entrepreneurship, but, um, you know, being on the 
the younger side of life. You don't really have people around you that are typically, even as an entrepreneur in any stage of your life, you don't really have a lot of people that you can talk to. At least for me, it's all online. Mm -hmm. The only really friends I have that I can talk to about it is online, uh, which kind of sucks sometimes. You know, it's, I, I guess I never really thought about it like this, but but both of my companies and even the next one that I'm I'm getting involved with, we we had co-founders, um, yeah. which I think is definitely a a big difference than obviously like starting on your own and everything. And it's hard to find people to talk to about problems and things like that without doing these like CEO pay a thousand dollars per month and do a roundtable thing. Like I don't know, I never really wanted to do that, but like I guess that's an avenue. But it's hard. Uh, I'm with you, and then. And then I guess what you're saying with the internet is like you never know if that person like what they're actually were they actually successful or whatever are they just speaking out their ass or whatever so uh, I hear you there. Are you guys looking to hire any positions right now? Yes, uh, we're looking for a uh, client success manager. Well, is it because well someone's going to hear this? I mean, they may apply. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. All right, yeah, we're looking for a client success manager in the U.S. We're looking for a an appointment setter, hopefully based in somewhere in South America. And we're looking for a uh, any type of graphic designer or video editor. And Perfect. and an operations manager based in the U.S. Perfect. So growing uh, quickly, I guess. Uh, yep. Last question, book and podcast recommendations. Yeah, that can be business, marketing. It could be fiction, whatever you want. Uh, I'm not big on books or podcasts, to be honest. I'm really not. But uh, I'll tell you the ones that have in impacted me. Yeah. Uh, um, you do have you do have like 15 books behind you, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, you know, sometimes you buy the books that you don't read it or you read like have, my shelf of unread books is bigger than my shelf of read books. Yes, <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> Let's see. I read the book. Um, well, it's not directly related to entrepreneurship, but Sapiens has been freaking mind blowing. Like, it, holy <laughs> last time, but this time it is within arms arms reach of me. Nice. It was, I mean, it's, it's kind of just like, it makes you think about, you know, who you are and what you do and why you think the way you think is very fascinating. Um, I've heard uh, an alternative called the dawn of everything, which is on my next read, um, which as I've heard was great too. Uh, developing the leader within you by John C. Maxwell. That's been a really good one. Um, I would say the best one for sales for me was Jordan Belfort's way of the wolf. That I think that's what it's called. That was probably one of the most impactful books I had ever read because it helped me with sales. Um, and podcast, Alex Hermosi's podcast is freaking amazing. If you guys don't know what it is, uh, Alex Hermosi. I forgot what it's called, but um, yeah, Alex Hermosi. Um, his podcast is freaking amazing. Awesome. Well, uh, as we come up to the end of the episode, I just want to give you an opportunity to mention how people can find you and anything else you'd like to end with. Sure. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, but I don't use it. You can find me on Instagram. That's primarily what I use. Uh, you can follow me at um, Vanta Shanta, uh, F A N T A A dot Shanta, S H A N T A. You can find me there. Uh, I'm going to get more serious about posting content around building the agency and business and entrepreneurship and my hobbies and all that fun stuff. So if you do follow me, you can check out some more stuff there. Well, hopefully this podcast sparks uh, all that content. So Shanta, yes, thank you so much for coming on the show. Love the episode. Um, and for those of you who have learned something new from this episode, obviously please consider giving us a like or a follow so we can continue getting the highest quality guests and always, as, as always, thank you for listening, Shanta. Awesome time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for listening to the Masters in Marketing Agency podcast. I hope you got a ton of value out of this episode. And before we go, I just want to thank our sponsors, DevNoodle. DevNoodle provides marketing agencies with the ability to offer their clients unlimited website design, build, and management services with fixed monthly plans. If website design, development, and maintenance is holding your agency back from growing, please reach out to us at devnoodle.com where we make websites easy, easy for you and easy for your clients, devnoodle.com.